Luke chapter number 24 will be our scripture reading. We're going to be looking at verses 44 through 53. That's where we're at. We're currently in a series. And actually today is the last part of the series. So looking forward to, to that. Verse number 44 of Luke chapter 24. When we're all there, I'll go ahead and read out loud. All right. Verse number 44 of Luke chapter 24 says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out uh, as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our message. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time together to read your word, to understand your word better, and to truly make it a difference in our lives to become more like Christ, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. We ask you to help us, help our hearts to be open for the message you want us to hear. And Father, we thank you so much for your word, how amazing it is that you have given us your word on the matter. We don't have to wonder, we don't have to uh, hope, as in the sense of what humans say about hoping that it might not come true, but rather we have a steadfast assurance in the promises that you have made for us. We thank you for all that you have given. I ask you to help me as I speak, and bless the message I do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our study was the life of Jesus Christ. It was called A Biography of Jesus. We started this, and I had to look it up. When did we actually start this series? It was December, late December 2020. And so amazing about how one year, you know, we've been going through the life of Christ. And such a blessing it has been. And and more and more that I I study, the more and more I, I look at Jesus as the great God-man that he is, the great Savior that he is, we notice more and more things about what he would do or what he would say. I began this series talking about uh, WWJD. What would Jesus do? But in order to answer that question, you have to ask the question, well, what did Jesus do? And so we've been going through this series, and today is the last part of the series. It's the ascension of Jesus Christ to the Father. and But yet, before he goes up, he gives the disciples amazing commands, but also wonderful promises. So we're going to look at the wonderful, uh, hard commands for the disciples that we as a church body need to understand more and more and need to take heed to and the promises that will also encourage us while we complete the command. So first of all, we're going to see three lessons from each one of these scriptures that talk about the ascension that we're going over today. First of all, turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 is the first place that we're headed to. It's an amazing thing of trying to do a... Uh, a commentary on the entirety of the Gospels into one sermon. It's hard to go from place to place, but uh, Mark chapter 16 was we're going to start there. And we're going to see the first lesson as that we need to preach 
every way possible because it is our responsibility. So the disciples are given a command and precious promises, but yet we ought to, as well as the church, be preaching every way possible because it is our responsibility. Notice with me in chapter 16, verse number 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, right there, right off the bat, I thought to myself, what in the world, why use the word preacher? Yeah, am I supposed to be going out and preach to the geckos that are out on the, on the porch area? Or uh, I used to be in South Florida where I grew up uh, 12 years to 18, uh, and my favorite animal there were ducks. They are all over the place in South Florida. Uh, they are, and uh, they make quite a big mess. Uh, but the, the amazing thing is, is the Bible teaching me that I need to go preach to the ducks? And the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. But this is actually what it's talking about. The word creatures here is used uh, specifically for the creation itself. The chief of creation, well, it's man. You see, in the Genesis account, we have... Uh, the entirety of account, he went from day to day preparing the world, making an atmosphere for the world, producing vegetables, plant life, and marine life, animal kinds. But then the last one in the list in Genesis chapter 1 is man. Man, he said, let us make man into our image. So because of that, the Godhead itself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, created man in his, in his own image. And this is the who we're supposed to be preaching to throughout the entirety of the world. It says in verse number 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every, every person that is under the sun. Verse number 16, here's what it, it's interesting. Verse number 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. All right, stop right there. So the command is for us to preach. And the reality of it is a person saying, well, okay, do you have to be baptized in order to receive Christ as your own personal Savior? And the answer is no. I used to believe that you do. I used to believe that. And I used to actually t tell people, like I, I remember in seventh grade and eighth grade, it's really when I got into the scriptures, uh, I was telling a Baptist why they were wrong and why they should come over to my side. I was very persuasive in this, and I used the scriptures, I thought, very well uh, to prove my points. But in all reality, the scriptures that I used to prove it, I later found out, oh, those are not talking about water baptism. Those are not talking about baptism at all, in fact. Sometimes, some of the verses I used. So, can a person be saved and not baptized? Yeah, that's true. For a person to be saved, all you have to do is understand that you, in fact, are a sinner. That's true of every single person on the face of the planet. We sin because we're all related back to Adam and Eve. Eve was deceived. Adam rebelled. And through Adam came the sin nature for every single person born of Adam. Now, we're going to talk about it tonight, about the second Adam, and talking about Jesus Christ. But we think about Adam, we all have the sinful nature from him, and by default, we all sin. The wages of sin is death. That's not a pleasant thought, is it? Death. Separation. Separation from the love of God, separation from the joy of God, separation from God himself into God's wrath. It's not a pleasant thought at all, but here's the great news about it. God knew that we could not earn our own salvation, so he sent his son into the world to die on our behalf, literally becoming my own sin as he hung on the cross. Praise the Lord. And then three days later, up from the grave, he arose. And because he's a risen Savior, we can put our faith on who he is and put our faith in what he has claimed and put our faith in the promises that he has made to his disciples. 
So the wonderful command for all of us is that we ought to preach. Now you might say, well, I'm a female. I've heard all my life that females can't preach. Well, in one sense, yeah. Uh, understandably, in the congregation of the church, we believe here at Chapel Baptist that a pastor can only be male. That's what the Bible says. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with people that really disagree with me about that. And in all reality, I'm like, oh, this is what the Bible says. This is the original language. that You can't say, oh, the bishop is a husband of one wife and take it to mean that, well, the wife can be the pastor. You can't. It's impossible. So a lot of people like to stretch that out. But the question is, well, do everybody, though, have the command to preach? And the answer is yes. What preaching is, is proclaiming what God has done for you. What has God done to you in that of salvation? Testimony is a wonderful thing that we all have that are in Christ. We all have a testimony that one day we understood, yes, I am a sinner. That came when I was 12 years old in a computer lab in public uh, middle school. Amazing place to get saved. But there I was. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a sinner. And I was going to hell. But what I also understood was that Jesus died for me. And I put my faith on Christ. And that moment, I got saved. Praise the Lord. And I've given my testimony over and over again to people that I used to work with. Amazing opportunity to go back to my coworkers and talk to them a little bit. Uh, this past week, so we praise the Lord for that. But think about, think about it. Everybody here can give a testimony. Unless, of course, you have never received Christ, I implore you, today, today is the day that you should do that. But think about it. Every single person should preach. Every single person should give and proclaim the reality of what Christ has done for each and every one of us. And notice with me what the promise is here in the book of Mark. Notice with me verse number 17. And it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So that's the promises given to the disciples that were there. Specifically, this is for the apostolic age, meaning the first century church. Uh, we don't believe here that these signs are still going on today. Now, they could come every, like, randomly once in a while, just kind of, out of, but it's not the norm. It's not the norm for us to start speaking in unknown tongues. That was for the first century, but then when the word of God came, that which is perfect came, then those signs were done away with, by and large. So that's not the typical thing. Like, it's not typically, I'm going to go out and try to find a uh, coral snake, grab it, and okay, it, it can bite me, and it's not going to do anything. Well, there have been preachers that have done that, and they didn't make it to next Sunday. Yeah, it, so it's, okay, that's not really what it's talking about for today, but back then, yes. Every single one of these you see in the book of Acts, except for one and that is the, uh, let me see, if, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. That's the only one that's, that is not mentioned in the book of Acts with the apostles. So the question is, if somebody was trying to poison you, and you drank it and nothing happened to you, would you know? Probably not. <laughs> probably not. If it did not kill you, you would probably not know that there was poison in the drink. So it's interesting to, to note that. But think about it. These people, these individuals, the disciples that were given this command and these promises, they were given the authority to do all these things. So they are going to preach the gospel in every way possible. Every way possible means that of they're going to do the signs, they're going to do the wonders, and that's going to authenticate their message. For each and every one of us, we need to preach every way possible. And the wonderful thing about preaching, it not necessarily has to be with words. Think about this. If your neighbors knew that you were a Christian, 
and you acted a certain way that showed you are a Christian. That's a bigger testimony at times than sometimes the things that come out of our mouths. For, for me, being at the hospital, at times I was good, and at times I was doing exactly what I should be and doing everything very helpfully and everything was going very well and, and my preaching was not with my words necessarily but with my way of living, my way of lifestyle. Now, true enough, good at some point that you mess it up? Absolutely. I've had times that, oh, that shouldn't be what a Christian, like somebody told me, and you are a man of God. Wow, that burned, oh, terrible. But he was right. The way I was acting wasn't what the Bible says I should act like. So I had to repent and apologize to the guy, and we were back on good terms. But think about it. Every way possible we preach, by us living our lives, by us saying the words that we speak, by us praying the way we ought, by us reading the Bible as we ought to, the way we, we live shows us whether or not we are preaching the right message. And sometimes we have to take account of what we do, what we say, what we think, and say, is this really what the Bible has in mind? Wonderful thing to remind us about. But now, not, not only should we preach every way possible, this is a responsibility, but number two, that discipleship is goal, is the goal of the church. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Here we have what is commonly called the Great Commission. What most people would use for the Great Commission. Notice with me in verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to start reading there. Verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, the disciples, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Here, the command is to go. And specifically, go and teach. The word here for teach is that of disciple making. Making a person a disciple of Christ. Now, the first part of a person becoming a disciple of Christ is that they need to be saved. That's number one. A person needs to be saved in order for them to actually be a disciple of Christ. Christ. If they haven't done that, then they're really not a disciple. Um, but here, it's not only are they saved, but they're brought into the church and shown how to be what they're supposed to be, how to be a disciple of Christ, how to be a Christian, how to pray, how to evangelize, how to read the Bible, how to do all these things that we ought to do, how to be at church and get a lot out of it. This is what we ought to be doing and the things that they're commanded to do. And notice with me, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Well, this thing called baptism keeps on showing up. What is the purpose of baptism, you might ask? The purpose of baptism is an outward declaration of the inward change that has happened in salvation. So this is you going and saying, okay, I want to identify with Jesus in public. And so what they would do back in those days, they would be near a stream or near a pond or, or they would have these little things, uh, uh, little pools that they would go and there's water in it. You would be dunked entirely, immersed underneath the water and then brought back up. Any other way of baptism, we wouldn't consider really as baptism necessarily. Because the word baptize means to be immersed, to be totally dumped, okay? Well, what if, what if my little pinky was up in the water and was like, really baptized? Well, we're not going to go into legalistic terms of, okay, um, were you baptized? Did you publicly announce your faith in Christ? Did you go under the water? Did you come up? Then you're baptized. Now, for me, I wasn't baptized correctly. When I was baptized, I, I was baptized the day before I got saved. 
So because I was baptized the day before I got saved, it wasn't quite correct. Because I believe that baptism saved me at that point in time. But now I know better. And so I was rebaptized here at this church when I was assistant pastor. Pastor Lupino actually rebaptized me in the water. He would say I, that he baptized me the first time because I really wasn't baptized the second, which, true enough. So a person ought to obey Christ, obey the, the ways of, of what the Lord wants us to do by saying yes to baptism. Baptism is a special thing. You might ask, oh, where is your baptism, your, your baptismal here at this church? I don't see one. Well, there's this... Uh, choir rise, right? Well, we take off the, the, the chairs, take off the uh, podiums, and underneath that it opens up, and there's the baptism. Baptismal. Right under there. So, it's always a, a, a unique experience of having somebody baptized here at our church. So, we praise the Lord for that. Um, but think about it. It doesn't make you saved, but rather it declares that you have done what you need to to get saved. So that's what that is, baptism. And so beyond that, though, it says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The word observe there has the understanding of that of keep, of guard, to be persistently doing. It's that of, it illustrates that of a military person. For instance, if a person in military terms back then, um, they were guarding a a um, prison and they let the person go, what would happen to them is that they would forfeit their lives. They would be executed. So they would keep that prison very, very close eye on that prison. So one uh, illustration of this in Acts, when Paul and Silas were in the prison and they were praising God, then all of a sudden the the walls of the, the prison shook with that of the earthquake and all their chains fell off and the, and the doors opened wide and the guard, he was asleep. He wasn't doing his job. He wasn't keeping watch. He wasn't keeping guard, but he woke up. He was ready to kill himself and Paul said, no, no, everybody's still here. And then he got saved. Beginning of the, the Philippian church. So here we see the, the great command is that of making disciples. How do we make disciples though well here at chapel we don't have a specific class for discipleship making what we do have is sunday school we learn about the bible we have sunday morning service where we learn about the bible we have sunday evening service where we learn about the bible and then we have wednesday where we learn about the bible as well as pray one for another and then we'll have other opportunities in the future about doing outreach, other opportunities about in the future to do things around the church, other things that we could minister for the church in that way. There's other ministries that are available today, like Sound Booth. Judah and Timo are doing a great job doing the Sound Booth, as so is uh, Susan. And, of course, Mackenzie back there as well. But people, we need people in order to do the ministry that we have here. It's an amazing thing. Vacation Bible School. I praise the Lord for every single person that has signed up on that, uh, on that sign-up sheet. Praise the Lord. We're going to have a good time uh, with Vacation Bible School. Now, if people don't sign up, we might not do the extent as to what we had in the past. So that's just the, the commendation of okay, encouragement. Okay, let's get into the ministry. Let's get into the ministry God wants you to be a part of. But then we have the great, great promise here. Very last part of verse number 20. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The word world there is that word of age. Okay. At the end of all ages, Jesus Christ will be with us. Whether we're trying to evangelize, whether we're trying to disciple, Jesus is with us. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He has given us that power, that authority, and for us to evangelize, for us to disciple. But not only that, number three, last but not least, 
We need to be reminded of God's promises to keep us encouraged as we obey what he says to do. Notice with me, Luke chapter 24, that's where our scripture reading was this morning. Luke chapter 24, that's where we're going to turn to. And the last part of this is specifically for them at that point in time. Now, these other two passages were for them, but yet for us as well. Here, it's specifically for them, but I want to make sure that we know the promise. Notice with me what it says in verse number 46. And, he, and said unto them, Jesus saying to the disciples, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye, shall, ye are witnesses of these things. Now, stop right there. Think about the word repentance. And most people, when they make the term repentance made, they make it incorrectly. For instance, what people would say is that you have to repent of all of your sins in order to receive Christ. Well, no, that's not the, what the word means. There's a word that does mean that. This word doesn't. This word is actually a turning a 180. That you were going one way, you were believing that you were going to heaven one way, whether it be by works, whether it be by the prayers that you pray or doing the rosary or whatever, or that baptism saved you, you think you believed that you are getting saved one way, then you realize that Jesus is the only way, he is the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father but by him, and you, you agree with that. You turn to 180. You start agreeing with what the Bible says. You start agreeing with what the scripture proclaims truth to be, and you receive Christ as your own personal savior. That is biblical repentance. Now, there is a place for sorrow for sin, yes. But that's not necessarily what this word means. So we see repentance and the remission of sin. Put your faith in Christ, you have the remission of sin. And beginning at Jerusalem. Now, for us, we don't begin at Jerusalem. Because that's a literal location that they did begin at. Here, we begin here. We begin our church outward. Our church, the Four Corners. Our church, Claremont. Our church, Davenport. Our church, Citrus Ridge. Our church, Kissimmee. Our church, Groveland. I think I'm in the right location when I point. Uh, but with all of this, start where you're at. But here is the promise that he gives you. Verse number 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. What is the promise of the Father that he is going to give the disciples if they go back to Jerusalem? Here it is. John chapter 14, verse number 16 and 17. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. You need to understand the context of that in order to understand and discern what it's talking about for us today, though. The Holy Spirit is given to every single believer in Christ the moment that we receive Christ as our own personal Savior. We are sealed unto the day of redemption through the Holy Ghost. Now you say, oh, you're talking about the Holy Ghost. You're going to be talking about speaking in tongues and, and healings and all that. The Spirit is able to do it, yes. But he chooses not to do it because it's not the point in time that it was back then. Now, the people that do speak in tongues, quote unquote, according to what the Bible says about the word tongues, it's not really what it's talking about. The word tongues... In the, in the Bible, it's talking about that of actual language, like actual language. Like if I was American, which I am, uh, I go to Africa. Did I learn Swahili? No, I was given this, uh, the gift of tongues. I didn't have to. I, I just spoke, and it was translated into Swahili for me, just automatically through the Spirit. Huh, that would be kind of useful. It's like a universal translator type thing, you know. Um, but think about it. We don't have that because we have the Word of God. 
and the Word of God translated in a majority of languages across the world. Yes, there are tribes that need to be translated into their local tongue, but by and large, we have it translated through the, the languages of the world. So when we go to Africa, we have a Bible that's already translated for us. We have a Bible, if we go to Spain, already translated for us. We go to South America, go to Brazil, it's in Portuguese. Anywhere else, it's Spanish. It's already translated. German, there's already a translation. It's a German translation. So with all of that said, though, we have the Holy Spirit, the author of the book, the author of the scripture. It is given by inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit moved the individuals and had them write. So we have a perfect word. So the thing about it is that we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And that is a magnificent promise that we have the third person of the Trinity with us at all points in time. Jesus says, I am with you even unto the end of the world and end of the age. Jesus Christ is with us through the Holy Spirit. So each and every one of us has that. So the question that we have in front of us as a church, what are we going to do with what God, through Jesus Christ, has commanded us to do? And the answer is we need to evangelize and we need to disciple. And remind ourselves about the promises of God. Well, how do we do that? Well, personally, here's four specific elements to help us with evangelism personally. First of all, number one, we need to pray for opportunities. Pray for opportunities. If we don't want to evangelize, that shows a little thing about our own heart, um, but we won't pray about it, surely. Oh, we will pray for the missionaries. Oh, let them be the evangelists. You'll pray for me. Oh, let him spread the gospel throughout the entirety of Central Florida. But we're only one people, one person. But if every single person here were to touch the lives of people around them, what happens is that it becomes bigger, becomes bigger, becomes bigger. When I was working at South Lake Hospital, I was touching their lives for the gospel. Now, a little harder, people I meet, talk to a little bit. I, I understand what Pastor Lapino was saying when he said sometimes, uh, you know, he's envious of people that are actually in the real world working in their own places because you have more contact with unsaved people than pastors do. And that's true. That's very true. But think about it. We need to pray for the opportunities and not just pray, oh, oh Lord, let, let the opportunity come, but Lord, I want this opportunity to happen. May you make it happen with this person or with that person. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's it's a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's somebody that, that you know that you see every once in a while. If whoever it might be, whatever person that's come and put God has put that person on your heart, pray for the opportunity, willing and desiring it to happen. Number one, pray. Number two, be ready with tracks or a presentation of the gospel that you are ready to give. Be ready to give tracts or a presentation of the gospel that you are able to give. Every single person that is in Christ has a testimony. God's been working on you, and you give that testimony, whether it be just you speaking about something that God did for you. For instance, your prayers being answered. Huge among unsaved people. I remember this one pastor uh, got a knock on the door. He opened it up, and it was uh, two Mormons. So you had the, you know, the white shirts, ties, bicycles. Yep, whole shebang. And so he, he came out and said, "Oh, hi, how are you?" And uh, and then, you know they did their spiel and all that. He's like, "No, I, I don't want to go your way." And they said, "Why?" Well, my God answers my prayers. And he started going and talking and talking and talking. They they eventually did not want to talk to him anymore, so they kind of backed away, backed away, and okay, but he's, he's following them, just talking about how God has answered his prayers over and over and over again, over and over and over again. Then he, he eventually I turned around and basically say, stop, stop telling us about how your God answers your prayers. Isn't that wonderful? 
Anytime that we have an answer to prayer, praise the Lord. And if we praise the Lord because of what he did in our lives, we share it with somebody else. And they can have at least a little kernel of truth. A little promise from God. A little understanding of what the Bible says. We need to be ready with tracts or presentation with the gospel. Number three, uh, we need to watch for opportunities. Not just pray for it, not just be ready for it, but see if there's a door that's opening in front of you. Perhaps it's something that they said and it triggers, oh, I can talk about this, which leads to this, that leads to the gospel. Oh, I talk, talk about the weather. Who made the weather? Uh, God. God did what he did through Christ. And it, all these different ways of going about it, it's like, it's an amazing thing. So just watch for opportunities. Number four, practice giving your testimony and giving the gospel out. Practice it. Just practice it. You might say, well, I, I'm really bad at it. Practice it. Practice it. The only way we get better at things is if we practice. I played violin for numerous years. When I first started, it was terrible. <laughs> I sounded horrible. Horrible. Like, yeah, it, it was terrible. But I kept on practicing, kept on practicing. Had private lessons. Got better, got better, got better. I was able to get into one orchestra in the, in the area that I auditioned for, and they, okay, you're in this orchestra. Worked my way up, worked my way up, okay. Okay, next orchestra. In fact, if you get into that orchestra, they're going to Carnegie Hall to play. <laughs> okay, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing. And lo and behold, God says yes. <laughs> they said, yeah, you'll, you're going to be in that orchestra, and you get to go with them to Carnegie Hall. I was the last, 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 last second violinist part in the entirety of the orchestra, but that doesn't matter because I was there at Carnegie Hall. Why? Because I practiced. I practiced. I practiced, I practiced, I practiced. Now, did I practice as much as I should have? Probably not. But if we practice more and more, the better at something we'll probably be. Practice, practice, practice. Practice giving the gospel. If it's just you looking at yourself in the, in the mirror in the morning and just trying to give the gospel to yourself, that's practicing. Or it's just going through the, the Bible of, okay, the Romans road or, or the different things in the book of John that we can go back to the gospel. Or just practicing John 3.16. That's the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amazing. So those are easy, those are elements to help us in our evangelism as a church. You know, the most biblical way for a church to grow is? It's not because we have really cool programs, which we, we have some programs. We have some things that we do. That's true. It's not through uh, gimmicks. I heard of one church. Oh, come to our church and uh, give us your visitor's card and you'll be entered in a chance to win a free cruise to Hawaii. Oh, yeah, you might be coming to that church for the wrong reason. <laughs> I want to go to Hawaii, free of charge. So weird. No gimmicks. Programs are fun, but that's not the, what, biblically speaking, that brings people to the church. It's the church going out, touching lives for Christ, and then bringing in. That's how we grow biblically. Now, we, we're going to have outreach opportunities later uh, at, with the year coming on. Uh, we have some ideas about what we're going to be trying to attempt to do. But think about it. You have opportunities where you live, where you're at, to reach people for the gospel. And may each and every one of us decide to say yes to that. Um, we're going to have a moment of prayer. And any... Anybody that wants to receive Christ as their own personal Savior, you could just do it easily through a prayer. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know what the Bible says. I deserve hell. And I know there's nothing I could do to earn my way out. But I know what Jesus did. I receive him as my own personal Savior. If you pray that prayer in your heart, you 
you're a child of God. If you receive Christ, you have the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For those of us that maybe this message has really touched us about, man, we really should get going with these evangelism thing or get going with a discipleship thing, then may we make a decision in our hearts for this next week that we'll do more for him. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. Well, we're just going to have a time of prayer. I'll start us off. Then we'll have some silence as we pray. And then I'll finish us up. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this time that you have given us. We rejoice in your word. We rejoice in the ascension of Christ. How amazing it is to know that he is on high at the right hand of the throne of God. And Father, we know that he is being the, the mediator between us and you. Father, we thank you for this time that we can pray. May you help us as we do to have, make decisions here and now that will affect eternity. I do pray in Jesus' name.